Okay, hi everyone. So this is uh, going to be the last video in this basic terms. I know it's been a long topic, uh, but there's quite a few basic terms we need to discuss before we can get into the actual thermodynamic uh, discussion itself. So that's why we have set so many videos in this topic. Um, so the last concept I want to talk about a little bit after discussing the state and non-state function in the previous video is talking about how we can represent energy changes using something called the energy diagram. And this is really a, a fairly straightforward uh, idea. So if you remember, uh, and this is analogous to the gravitational potential energy, so I want to bring that uh, example up again. So if you remember that um, when we talk about potential energy, we can basically represent if this ball has a certain potential energy, uh, it, you know, it, it's going to be placed at different height depending on what it, its potential energy is. So if it's at a higher position, then it's going to have uh, more potential energy. If it has lower height, then it's going to have less potential energy because if you remember, gravitational potential energy is equal to m times g times h, which is height. So if the height is closer to the ground or closer to zero, then the potential energy will be lower. If the height is uh, further away from the ground, which means that it, it's a bigger number, then it's going to have a uh, higher potential energy. So um, in terms of you know, representing chemical reactions, we can do the same thing, which is that instead of representing this as a ball, we would say there's a molecule, for example, molecule A in this case, and the closer molecule A is to the lower, you know, to the bottom of this energy uh, axis, then the uh, lower its energy is, and then the higher uh, the position of molecule A is, then the higher is its energy. So in other words, it's exactly analogous to this uh, gravitational potential energy axis. Okay. Now there's an additional term I want to use here to um, give to you so that you remember this because we're going to use this again and again. I'm going to use it uh, while I'm talking about energy quite a bit. And that's the term stability. Okay. So we talked about stability uh, in terms of energy with the following perspective. The lower the energy of a system, like the ball in this case, the lower its energy is, which means that the closer it is to the ground, the more stable that ball is. So we say it's increasing its stability when it's closer to the ground. Vice versa, when the ball is higher, further away from the ground, then we say it becomes less stable, so then its stability decreases. And again, what we're talking about here is energetic stability, stability in terms of energy. So we use that same convention to talk about the stability of a molecule. Like I said earlier, the higher the energy of the molecule, in other words, the further away it is from the bottom, then the less stable the molecule is. And the lower the energy of the molecule, the more stable the molecule is. Okay? So now let's talk about, let's say, a process. Let's say this ball starts from this height y1 and it falls to this height y2. Okay, so in other words, it goes from this height to this height right here. What's the change in the internal energy of the ball? Well, that's just delta E, and delta E is equal to final E minus initial E, in this case, E of the y2 minus E of the y1. And you can see here that because this the value of energy is lower here compared to the value of energy here. If I subtract these two numbers together, I should get a negative number. And if I get a negative number, that means that energy is released by the ball, which makes sense, right? When a ball falls to the ground, energy is being released by the ball, potential energy in this case. Okay, so that should make sense in terms of you know your your understanding of the pro the process itself and the calculation that you have. Now we're going to use that same uh, idea and apply it to molecules as well. So if you have two molecules, A and B, where A is your reactant and B is your product, if you have a reaction where A converts to B, reactants goes to product, and A the energy of A is at this level and the energy of B is at this level. If A goes to B, that means the change in energy for this reaction will be the final state, which is the energy of product or the energy of B, minus the initial state, which is the energy of A, and you get a negative number as a result of that. So the delta E, in other words, in this case, is negative with respect to that reaction. Okay, so hopefully that makes it clear. Now, of course, if we 
switch this reaction where we have B goes to A, now we have a positive delta E because we're going from an initial state that's lower in energy to a final state that's higher in energy. So when you take final minus initial, you get a positive number. Okay, this has been a, a you know a quite a long uh, uh, set of videos talking about various terms and definitions associated with thermodynamics. So I want to summarize some of the concepts that are important here. First off, I want to talk about that the idea of understanding energy is because we want to understand how chemical reactions occur because energy is a uh, component of chemical reactions. So you cannot separate the energy out of a chemical reaction. It's just part of it. Everything that happens always has an energy component. So, so uh, are chemical reactions. As a result, in order to understand chemical reactions, we have to understand the energy that accompanies chemical reaction. If we are able to measure energies uh, of molecules that are involved in a reaction, we can then explain and then further on predict what's going to happen to the reaction. In order to do this, we need to calculate this quantity called delta E, which is the change in the energy as a result of the reaction. And you can get that by taking the value of the final energy of the system minus the initial energy of the system. Remember that the system in our case is the reaction molecules themselves, which are the reactant and the product. Okay, Now, we can't really measure internal in energy directly. Okay, It's impossible for me to look at a sample of uh, you know, a, a reactants in a test tube and say, well, what is the internal energy of that sample? There's just too many different factors I have to measure and it's just not a practical way of doing things, okay? Um, there's, there's all these different interactions between atoms, uh, with other atoms, with nucleus and electrons. There's a kinetic energy. I have to measure all of those and have to add all of them up in order to get the absolute value of the total energy. And there's no way I can do all of those things. But we don't really need to know that because I don't really care about what the actual value of final, minus in, uh, final and initial is. The only thing I care about is delta E. So if you think about delta E, you can actually measure it by measuring Q and W because delta E is equal to Q plus W. So if I know how much of the reaction, how much heat the energy, uh, the reaction absorbs or release, and how much work the, ener the reaction release or absorb, I can add these two numbers together and get my delta E value. Okay, and that's sort of the idea of discussing e, uh, Q and W there because Q and W are basically ways that we can get at delta E. So if we can get Q and W, we should be able to calculate delta E. And in the next set of topics, we will talk about exactly how we can calculate W and how we can calculate Q to be able to calculate delta E. Now. I want to go through a couple of examples here just to show you uh, how to apply some of the concepts we discuss in this set of videos. Okay, So example two here is asking you a fairly simple question here, which is that let's say I have this energy diagram for carbon and um, oxygen, solid carbon and oxygen gas, and I have another energy level for CO2 carbon dioxide. Okay, so uh, I have both of these energy diagrams shown here on the left and on the right. On the left is showing the formation of carbon dioxide from the uh, solid carbon combining with uh, oxygen gas. On the right it's showing a reaction where carbon dioxide decomposes to form carbon solid and oxygen gas. Okay. The first question is just asking which uh, you know, it, given this energy diagram, right, which is more energetically stable? Is carbon dioxide more stable or is carbon solid and uh, oxygen gas more stable? Okay, now you can stop the video, think about it, and then, uh, and then play again because I'm going to answer the um, question right now. So the one that's more stable, remember, is the one that's lower in energy, right? So in both cases, it's the same energy diagram. Uh, essentially, it's just illustrating different reactions. The CO2 is the more stable species. So the CO2 is more stable in comparison to the separated elements, okay? Now, question B is asking, considering just the energy diagram given above, which process is likely to take place? 
do you con do you think it's more likely that the elements go to form the compound or is it more likely that the compound decomposes to form the elements okay now again think about it and then answer it but the answer here is that this is more likely why is that well you think about a ball I go back to this example earlier you think about a ball if I have a ball is it more likely that the ball will fall from top to bottom or is it more likely that the ball will suddenly rise up from the ground to the sky okay as all of your experience uh, tells you ball balls always fall from the top to the bottom it never goes from the bottom to the top on its own except if somebody lifts it up right but spontaneously the ball will come down from the top to the bottom so this idea is extended here for reactions as well it's more likely that these type of reactions would happen in other words the elements would form the compound rather than compound decomposing because the compound in this case is more stable than the elements okay so that's the idea of energy diagram here and how you can use it to predict directions of reactions we're really not going to do much of this in this uh, chapter uh, or in this topic this is really something that you'll discuss more in chem 12 but I do want to give you a heads up because that's the power of energy because you can then make prediction on which direction a reaction would, would go whether it's going to be the decomposition direction or whether it's going to be the synthesis direction and then in example three I want to talk a little bit about just using uh, you know this delta EQW uh, information and then using the appropriate signs to calculate to make the calculation so in this case you have a a situation where you have a vacuum cleaner it releases 255 calories of heat and it does 428 calories of work the question is what's the change in the internal energy of the vacuum cleaner if the vacuum cleaner is our system okay so the first thing to think about here in terms of how to solve this problem is you have to consider what are the terms that are given so it says it releases 255 kilojoules of heat that means that that's your um, Q right the question then is what is the sign you should put here whether it's negative or positive now it says it releases and the vacuum cleaner is our system remember that when we say it releases energy or releases heat in this case that means that with respect to the system this is a negative so we have to put the negative sign right there okay the W it says that it does 428 kilojoules of work so I have to put the number 428 kilojoules here because that's the amount of work that this vacuum cleaner does now again you have to worry about what is the sign that's appropriate for that because the vacuum cleaner is doing work that means energy is coming out of the vacuum cleaner so again it's a negative with respect to the vacuum cleaner delta E then is just a matter of adding both of these numbers right delta E is equal to Q plus W and then if you were to add negative 20 255 I should say uh, plus uh, negative 428 okay and they're both kilojoules in this case then the answer you get is 683 kilojoules and as you can see this is a negative again because you're adding two negative numbers here so again the negative here implies that the vacuum cleaner overall loses energy uh, as it is being used okay so that's the end of this uh, set of videos again it's been a long uh, set of videos to kind of walk through but you know the reason is you need to know all these basic definitions in order to be able to understand the next several topics that we'll talk about in thermodynamics